Welcome to the Rex Chapman Show with the super sexy, super talented Josh Hopkins. That's me. Ha- powered by basketballnews.com. That's them. Yes, sir. Hey, buddy. How How's it going? Doing? All good. It's good to see you. Good to talk to you. As always, I miss you, but uh, we get to do this again. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Before we jump in, uh, let's just do our segment, uh, Book Club. You read anything this week? No, I have not. I did not get a chance to. I was going to several times, and then right at the last moment, a couple times, I took a nap. Uh, right, right. So no, I didn't. I didn't get. To I got it. hungry. I got a book. You didn't read it. Hungry. You didn't read uh-uh. anything either. Uh-uh. Well, uh-uh. all right. Well, Next week. That's been book club. Okay. A uh, lot of lot of stuff going on in the NBA here, Rex. Let me just start with this. Okay. As the uh, play in game start, and and we get ready to go uh, full on playoffs here. You said about six weeks ago your your pick was the Nets in the East. No, you said to win it all. Oh, well, maybe I did. Maybe I did. Maybe I did. <laughs> you sticking with that, or, or yeah. do you have another idea now? I'm going with the Nets. They're healthy. Um, man, you know, we really haven't seen them in two or three weeks because James has been out. KD's been out. Uh, Kyrie, 50, 40, 90 season. Um, yeah. I mean, come on, that that dude's unreal. I, yeah, I like the Nets. I don't. I just don't love the Sixers. I don't love Milwaukee, but you know, Miami's a danger, of course. The team I'm, I'm uh, really, you know, I've got a special affinity uh, for the Suns out, out mm-hmm. west, and you know, going back a year, they were eight zero in the bubble. They're only one of two teams this year to win fifty games. And it's sort of the kind of be careful what you wish for with the Phoenix Suns. They're the two seed, and they're going to end up playing as the seventh seed, the winner of either the Lakers or the Warriors. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, yeah. Would you have ever thought that, that scenario could happen? They've completely flipped, uh, flipped the script. and uh, But you're going to have to play them at some point anyway. So I'm looking forward to that because the Suns are – very, very good. Yeah. Do you have right. another team that people might be sleeping on besides the Suns? You know, I, I, don't know. I don't know. I love watching the Knicks this year. The, the Knicks are – the league is always better when the Knicks are good. And the Kentucky Knicks? The Kentucky Knicks. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, we got Nerlens there. We got Kenny Payne there. Who else? We got Julius Randle. What, what about the year that guy's having? That's crazy, right? We got uh, uh, Knox Man, quickly, Quick. Kevin Knox, uh, Nerlens. <laughs> did we jump? Did we say everyone? I don't know. I think we that's have. how many we've jumped and with Kenny Payne. Kenny Boy, Payne, what on a the great bench. hire for them, huh? Right? I mean, but Tom Thibodeau's fantastic, you know, he's up. Tom, I've always felt, you know, he's kind of got a shelf life because he grit, grinds on you after a while, kind of like Scott Skiles, kind of like a lot of the great coaches. Right. Um, but, man, he's got a young team that's playing hard. And I think some of that, you know, the guys are buying in and playing so hard and, and, and consequently playing well. But these are guys, a bunch of them have been in New York for a couple of years and know how bad it's been and how bad it can be when you're losing there. Man, when you're winning, it's easy to do the right thing and come into the gym and, and the practice uh, facility every day and buy in. It's just been fun watching the Knicks. It's also been fun watching our friends who are Knicks fans, you know, right. uh, just yeah. out of nowhere yeah. have a season like this. Yeah, they needed it. The no city question. needed it. The city needed it. I know. I know. I used to uh, I used to live about two blocks from the garden and I'd watch the first quarter <laughs> on the garden network there. And then I run down and get a ticket for like a yeah. dollar. They'd <laughs> right. be giving them away after right. the first quarter, you know, and then I go in and watch the rest of the games. Oh, that's and great. that city is a different city when the Knicks are good. Right. And so much. It fun. is. Well, speaking, speaking of great coaches. Huh, I was going to say, speaking of the Kentucky Knicks. We've kind of got a Kentucky Nick today. Wow. What a great that? segue, Rex Everett Chapman. What's a segue? <laughs> it's one of those <laughs> things that you get on and I right around because yeah. they're weird. Um, no, who, who, who we got? Who we you got who today? We We've got Richard Andrew Patino, Rick Patino, Rick to us. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, unreal. Let's wow. Go. Oh, how about Rick? Oh, uh, I can't. <laughs> I can't wait. So let's quit with the chit chat. Let's get to him. Let's go to Rick. Coach, welcome. Welcome. Thank you, Rex. It's been too long that we've 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 always texted back and forth, but it's great to see you at least I on know. Zoom. A- absolutely. I'm so I'm so happy you uh, you decided to do this. I, I want to get right into things, but first, I want to know: Do you remember the first time we met? I believe it was five star basketball. <laughs> it was. Yeah. What do you What do you remember about that? Anything? Well, yes, because you were so I was doing player improvement, uh huh, and you were so much into what I was teaching at that time. And you asked a lot of questions. And then obviously I forgot where I was at that time, uh, what school I was at, but I was you were, you were at Providence. Providence. You, you had just taken the Providence job. And you know, I didn't know anything about Kentucky and, the, <laughs> and how they love basketball. I think I was in Kentucky. I did a clinic for Joe B Hall one time. Yeah. That's the only time I stepped foot in Kentucky. So then when I, I obviously found out all about you and everything else, I said, I don't think I can recruit this young man. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you my real, real quick. Uh, you, you're exactly right. And I was supposed to be a big shot at the camp, me and Ramil Robinson and Derek Coleman and J.R. Reed and all that. And you were going to give a, a, a lecture. We're all sitting there. And you asked, said, give me somebody out here who can really jump. Uh, you know, shot blocker, and everyone pointed to me. So I go out on the court, and you're going to teach. You could really play back then. You weren't. You were probably 28 or 29, and you were going to teach the giant killer how to get your shot off. You know, you got to shoot a little higher. And you came in the first time, and I beat it down to the other end of the court, and everybody went crazy. And the next nine or 10, you lo- I threw my arm out trying to block him. You just lobbed him right over my right over my hand and into the basket. So it was a great experience. Then a teaching moment, uh, you, you fin- started to finish your lecture. And you said, you know, I watched one of these games last night. And there's a young man here, pretty good player. And it'll never work in college. He went around his back at least 32 times last night. And right when you said that you side eyed and looked right at me. <laughs> and so I thought, well, better, better take that out of my awesome. So much for my great recruiting. <laughs> uh, coach. Uh, I mean, you're, you're probably, you may be the most interesting man in the world. What a life you've won titles. You've had a title taken away. Uh, uh, your best friend died 9-11, extortion, Hall of Fame career. Um, are you as competitive as you used to be? And, and what have you learned through all of this? You know, Rex, everything in life, some, some things in life you deserve and you earn. Some things are undeserving. Like that, that title that, uh, it, first of all, it can never be taken away. You can't. Right can't replace history, but that title by the NCAA will be given back because when you think about it, uh, what, what one person did inside a dormitory was, uh, was awful behavior, but it was not, they were not taking performance enhancing drugs. They did nothing to alter the games being played. Did, did they uh, organize strip parties? Yes, they did. And that should have never gone on ever. Um, And that person will never go back in the game because of it. And he's paid a heavy, heavy price because of his actions. That being said, that will be reinstated. I'm sure of that. I hope so. Because because when you think about it, those players like Russ Smith and Peyton Seaver and Gorky Zhang and Montrez Harrell, they did nothing to alter what went on during those games. The behavior by by an operations coach, uh, I, I couldn't probably never forgive, although I've tried many times. <laughs> I know you have. But, um, you know, when you coach 40 plus years, and, and you know this as well as, as you, you wanted a great high school, great college, great pros. And you, if you have a long career, uh, there's very few times, even the ones like Coach K, who it seems on the surface, didn't have bad moments Mm -hmm. when he had to step away from the game and all those rumblings about what that was all about. uh, It's kept behind a curtain, so to speak, but you don't know what goes on in other people's lives. Sometimes I always hear this and I repeat it quite often. 
when you get around a room and everybody just speaks 10 minutes of their problems, after the 10th person has spoken about his problem, you want yours back in a hurry. <laughs> and so it's, 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 right. it's, it's the game of life. And you take uh, the good with the bad. What I look at back on, and I'm ending my career at a small Catholic school, and it's a perfect ending for me at this small school because it's, a, it's going back to where you were at Five Stop. It's a boy, a ball, and a dream. And you end your dream trying to take a small Catholic school that's had great tradition and you want to take it to a level where Kentucky, Louisville, Providence, all of those were. And I tell you, because you're in Coach Calipari country, we are the only two coaches to take three different schools to a final four. And when I take Iona to a final four, Cal will never get that from me. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Well, we have our lead. Uh, This is how we will advertise the show (laughs) right there. That is great. That's thank you, coach. Coach, I have a question for you. Um, There's no doubt, and Rex has talked to me about it. We're great friends, and we've talked on the couch several times uh, just about you and coaching, and you are an all-timer. You, every place you go, the players and the team get better immediately. Your passion shows through. You've dedicated your life to this sport. When did you fall in love with basketball. I mean, you played, you were a great point guard in college, obviously a great high school player. Was there a moment, do you remember a kid, you know, this is, I love this and I'm going to spend my life doing it. Was there a moment? How oh, at a very young age, I just, uh, I went to the five-star basketball camp, um, had some success and won the MVP at an all-star game. And at that point I was in love with the game, but that took it to a new level. Um, but I actually, I love working with players more so than even the games itself. So I do something that's a little different than, than just almost every head coach. I take players in the mornings from eight to nine, nine to 10, 10 to 11, 11 to 12. I'm in my sweats. And for 45 minutes of that hour, I work with four players just on offensive moves, three points shooting, uh, off the bounce, step back shooting, Um, how to put plays in jail, like Rex was talking about, the body-to-body moves. They get up about 200 to 250 offensive moves and screen shooting. Then I go to the next four players. Then I work on post moves. And I enjoy that much more than the games because you see a Gorky Zhang go from a soccer player without a jump shot to a national championship game where a point guard is pinning down for him for a jump shot. (laughs) I did it a little bit different. Uh, I always marvel at what Cal's doing, because I could never do it. I could never do what Kay does or Cal does, take one and done basketball players. Uh, I, I go after the, the Francisco Garcias, the, um, the Mashburns, the guys that need Nazi Mohammeds. They need player development, but they have pro potential, but they need to be developed over time. And then you establish these relationships and then what happens? You get a Tony Delk, a Walter McCarty, a Derek Anderson, a Travis Ford, even going back to the Richie Farmers, the Sean Woods, the Darren Fellhaus, and the Pelfries. You see them blossom into great games. And, and, and that's, that's what player development is all about. Now, I don't disagree with what those other people are doing at all. What they do is amazing to me. It's just a different way of getting to the, the end of the journey. And right now, um, I take that, and how can I do it the last hurdle? How can I take Iona College and recruit the same players that I did at Louisville or UK? And I'm not talking about the Ron Mercers or the Antoine Walkers. That's not going to be – but how can I get a Francisco Garcia or somebody who's a little bit – Walter McCarty, who's only 165 pounds, and build them into something special? And that's the last hurdle in my my dream, so to speak. And it, it, it's, it's a big dream, but I think it can be done. Well, say, because you say, you've always said it's a conscious decision because that's what you love. What if the top five high school players all said, we want to go to Iona? What do you do in a scenario like that? I, I mean, that's crazy. 
<laughs> great for the school. What do you do? Well, I, I think that's a little, that's, that's a little bit of a, a dream that's probably unrealistic goal to achieve. <laughs> sure. Only because, look, uh, our gym holds uh, 3,200 people. We're a small school. Uh, we would love to become the Gonzaga of the East, uh, yeah. a small private school, Catholic school that's not in a great league. Um, and try to make the non-conference schedule like we have next year. We're playing Seton Hall in the Garden, Yale in the Barclays Center. We're in the Disney Classic with Kansas, Alabama, Georgetown. Try to make the non-conference schedule a killer. But uh, more of a dream would be to recruit. I have a young man right now, Nellie Joseph Jr., a rookie of the year, 6'9", from Nigeria. I got him from Nigeria. He was at the NBA Academy. I asked Gorky Zhang about him, and he told me, Coach, he's he can be big time with player development. I think he'll be a pro someday. If it's not the, NBA, the freshman, NBA. right? Yes. Yeah, he was he was different on your team. And I thought, how the hell did you get him? Freshman coming in to Iona? Come on. That's yeah, I have two, two players from Rwanda and Nigeria. At Iona, I, I can't get a major big man like Kentucky or, or like Kansas or UCLA. I've got to go to Africa, find somebody that just needs player development, needs a home. And, um, and that's what I've got with my young man, uh, Osborne Shima from Rwanda and Nelly Joseph Jr. from Nigeria. The guards, no problem. The small forwards and the wings, no problem. When, when you, you talked about the player development and that, that's always what stood out with me. You know, your teams in the nineties, Kenny Walker and I were there every day of the summer, essentially as their teammates, you know, uh, trying to help out as much as we can, but you allowed us to, to work out with them and which I'll, it was just heavenly. Um, but go back. Were you doing all the player development stuff coach with Billy Donovan and Del Ray Brooks at Providence? I did it back at Boston university with Brett Brown, the ex coach of the sixes. The, I, I actually think the 20 hour rule was put in because we got so much positive publicity in 87. I agree. I mean, if we were putting in 40 hours a week, we would play an hour before breakfast, an hour in between class time. <laughs> then we'd go a three hour practice. Then at night, Pop Lewis and I would play Billy Donovan and Delray Brooks two on two from 10 to 11 at night. Uh, the loser buys uh, shakes in the cafeteria. And we were everybody was talking about. So it had to be a 35 to 40 hour a week. And people would say, wait, wait, this is not what a student athlete should be doing. And we got so much press over it, it almost became a negative when it was a big positive. So I've been doing it for, for 30 some odd years. And I even would take the New York Knicks players, Mark Jackson and, and, and Oakley and those guys, and work on it before practice with them. Going back to when I worked for UB Brown, same thing before them, before they had player development coaches. I was UB Brown's only assistant coach. That was it. Richie Adubato <laughs> only came back for the games. He was an advanced scout. So it, it was, look, it's, it's, it's what builds. Everybody has different ways to do it. There's so many different ways to win today. Um, and I, I do it because I love doing it. I love seeing a young man like Donovan Mitchell who came in with a line oh. drive shot and leave with perfect arc and what he's doing or Terry Rozier what he's doing is absolutely amazing. And, you know, you go back to Nazi Mohammed. Yeah. I took Nazi Mohammed <laughs> because I was so tired of trying to gain weight on Walter McCarty. <laughs> he was 75 pounds overweight. And I said, this is going to be easy, easy getting guys to lose weight. He was the 13th man on our championship team. Didn't get a minute. He played 18 years in the NBA. Rex, you know, who was my, uh, my competitor to try and get him to come to UK uh, university no. of Illinois, Chicago circle. Was it really? And they, they didn't know whether they would offer him a scholarship. Oh my and gosh. I remember those. You made days. a JV team for him. You created right. that at Kentucky JV just to get him minutes. And took my GA, my manager and put him on the team <laughs> just so we could have a backcourt <laughs> play. And you know who that was? Oh. Frank Vogel, the head coach of the Lakers. <laughs> Are you still making your coaches play two on two in the mornings? No, nah, my knees are shit. <laughs> <laughs> my coaches are fat. They can't play. Reggie, Reggie Hanson, of course, my high school, uh, my roommate was with you. And uh, he was like, oh, we're going down to 
practice. I said, what do you mean? Practice in early? He said, no, the coach has got to play in the morning at six o'clock. Five, five thirty. <laughs> five thirty. To go. Tubby Smith said, Donna told me, his, his wife told me, you know, I couldn't even make love to my husband anymore because he would, he would go to bed with a jock strap on because he didn't want to be late for five thirty, And uh, he had his sweatshirt next to the bed. And then Herb Sendek blows out his knee with an ACL. Uh, we had so many people coming over to play. Those are moments I'll never forget. I, I wish I could still play at 530 in the morning. Do you want to get an advantage over the sports books during the NBA and NHL playoffs? How about an inside edge this MLB season? Then download BetQL, the only app you'll need to make smart bets. Their best bets algorithm scans over 350,000 bets per year to give you a best bet recommendation for every game across all major sports and gives you the reasoning behind why you should place the bet. BetQL also has tons of other tools like sharp data so you can see who the pros are backing and line movement so you can jump on betting opportunities in real time. Plus, you can save all your picks in one place to track your success and winning streaks, as well as view your rank on their leaderboards. Head to the App Store or Google Play Store now to download BetQL. You can also head to try.betql.co backslash rex. Enter the discount code rex at payment checkout for 25% off of their subscription offerings. Don't miss out on the chance to beat the book this summer. Well, you know, we had MASH on a couple of weeks ago. And of course, all your former players just love you to death. I talked about a couple of funny stories with MASH, but one with Nazi, I'm glad you brought it up. You know, you could tell right away he was a, a project. Uh, he was heavy, um, but he had great hands. He was a great teammate. And I'll never forget, though, he he kind of had a hurt ankle. Of course, he would. He was badly out of shape when he when he came in there and working his ass off. And uh, I remember Two or three days in a row, Nazi, Nazi didn't play, but you brought him his meals on the bike all day long. <laughs> well, I used to run with Nazi on the treadmill to try and get it off. I mean, he lost 75 to 80 pounds. And today he still hasn't gained the pound. He has a chef. He's meticulous. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. played 18 some odd years in the NBA. Matter of fact, his uh, – uh, he, he's just so well organized. He'll, he'll be a president of an NBA team someday. I believe that. I yeah. believe it wholeheartedly. You know, I want to, I'll let you get in a question here in a second, Josh, but I want to go back to, <laughs> um, you had just taken, well, you were with the Knicks and I had just come, I'd been at two years at Kentucky and I'm with Charlotte and one day we're playing you guys in New York or in, in Charlotte and you poked your head in the, uh, Charlotte locker room, t training room said, Rex, come here. And I walked out and went into your locker room. I'm fully dressed, getting ready to play you guys, which was weird. And I, I sat in and you said, sit down for a second. And you said, Hey, CM Newton contacted me about Kentucky. I don't know anything about Kentucky. You know, should I, you know, Eddie was kind of probably on the way out. And before you could even get it out, I said, coach, you got to take it. And, you know, had Kenny Walker on the team already. And I know Kenny was telling you the same thing. Um, go back, if you don't mind, and, and go through that process and what that was like getting to Kentucky because you got here and, and then go into Feldhouse and Pelfrey and Richie Farmer, who, you know, Richie wanted to quit every day for two years because it was so hard. And you talked him out of it. I talked him out of it. I just want to hear about those. That well, time. So CM came, came, uh, Eddie was already um, relieved and CM flew to New York and um, we spoke and I said, look, CM, I'm honored. But he said he had a no right away. They were going through some bad times with probation and so on. And I said, CM, look, we've won 52 games. We're, we're number one in the division. We beat the Pistons, the bad boys, 4-0 that year. So I really thought we were going to win the NBA championship, even though we were young. And I said, see, am I, we're going to win this. You've got to get a coach. Uh, it's just not me. So he went after PJ Calissimo. We swept that. the sixes in Barkley in the first round. Yeah. We were stopped. We were getting ready to play Chicago. CM calls back and says, look, PJ is not going to take the job. He flew to Lexington. He said, can I come in and speak with you again? 
And I said, sure, CM, but we're going to play the Bulls. He said, look, I'm going to wait for this thing to end. Uh, Dave Gavitt tells me we should hire you, and I'm going to wait for it to end. I said, okay, I think we're going to, it's going to go long, CM. Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, this guy named Michael Jordan, <laughs> uh, he put a stop to my dreams. Um, and then CM, I've heard of him. Then we worked, we worked it out with CM, and he, we, I flew in, going to be named the coach. CM said to me, look, Rick, we got a problem. The Lexington Herald leader got a hold of you gave some McDonald's coupons uh, uh, to some players back in the day at Hawaii. And we're in, I know, I know what you're all about. Dave Gavitt told me what you're all about, but we're not, this can't happen. So I said, okay. So we were ready to fly out the next morning, eight o'clock. He comes by to take me to the plane. Uh, and he says, look, uh, David Roselle wants to see you. Um, he wants to talk to you. I walked in with David Roselle and he said, look, forget about all that nonsense. We believe in you. We want you to be the UK coach. Uh, it's over. We, you're going to be the coach. We, you, we apologize for a sleepless night that you may have. That. And I didn't know what to do, what to say at that point. Uh, we, were going at, we were going back on the plane home. Yeah. And then I, I became the UK coach, took over a team that it was only like six or seven scholarship players. Mm-hmm. All the tall out-of-state players left. I was left with Farmer, Fellhouse, Woods, and uh, Hanson, and um, Pelfrey. And uh, right away, I knew we'd be a little slow. Right away, I knew we'd be a little unathletic. Reggie was a pretty good athlete. Yep. Sean Woods was very quick. Um, the rest of the guys, we were going to be small. But I found out a lot about Kentucky, not by going around town, but by the Kentucky kids. It meant so much to them. <laughs> to play at the University of Kentucky, they gave me a doctorate on what it was like to be a UK basketball player. And I bought into it. And the thing about Richie Farmer, you're right. He wanted to quit every single week. And finally he did quit. He went home. I called his parents and we, we went in the basement and they said, what's wrong, Rich? He said, Rock Oliver, our strength coach. I can't take him anymore. He just <laughs> abuses me every day. I, I just don't like lifting like this. And I said, okay, you know what, Rich? I, I, I should have never left New York. I was the Nick coach where I grew up. And you know what? I'm going to quit with you. Um, I want to go back home. You want to go back to Clay County. I want to go back to New York. I've had enough. I've had enough of these accents. I can't understand a word people say. Uh, I'm going back home too, Rich. And he, the parents started laughing. He said, coach, you're not going to quit. I said, yes, I am. I'm going to quit because I don't like the way this is going on. I don't like the way this is going on. There are a lot of things I just don't like. I'm going to forget about the 24,000 people that are going to be at the games. I'm going to forget about being on TV. I'm going to forget about this unbelievable tradition. I'm going back home because it's difficult for me. And right away, he got the message. I never forget these moments. He said, I know. Uh, okay, coach, I'll fight through it. And that was the last time he ever quit. And the rest is history. But that's exactly what happened in my basement in front of his parents. Yeah. I said I was going to quit, too. And I poked fun at him of course, in a way that he would understand. And from that point, those guys were as close to me as any people I've ever coached because we weren't a great team. We had the largest crowds in Rupp because there was no TV. Mm -hmm. Uh, The second year, I remember riding on a fire engine around town because we won the league championship, but we couldn't get an NCAA bid. But we celebrated anyway. I remember beating Shaquille O'Neal, Stanley Roberts, and um, I changed his name, Chris um, Jackson. Uh, Uh, He changed his name. I remember beating that with those small guys. Yeah. And uh, I was there, coach. I was there. So, you know, it's and and what people don't people forget often is they talk about that Christian late in the shot. But, you know, we played that overtime without Jamal Mashburn. Yeah, we didn't have Jamal in overtime. So those guys played him tooth and nail. Uh, They were quite a group. And when we came back, they were lifted to the rafters because of what by staying. Uh, But I'll never forget. You know, I'll never forget. Uh, Those guys, I'll never forget Billy Donovan at Providence. I'll never forget those guys at Kentucky. Uh, I'll never forget Mark Jackson and Patrick and Oakley at at New York. There are certain guys, certain point. That doesn't mean I 
uh, that Ron Mercer and Antoine and all those guys were right. great. They were awesome. But those guys stayed with me and helped me develop a love for UK. But more important than the love, teaching me what a priestly garment was all about. And that's what it was to them. And um, it was, I call it Camelot. It was seven years of never having a bad day. Obviously, mm -hmm. I spent 17 years at Louisville, had great days, had some bad days at the end. But at UK and Providence and the Knicks, I never had a bad day. And so when you look back, people always say, don't you wish you would have stayed? I said, yeah, probably, but I never had a bad day. And who yeah. can say that we, with only five years of eligibility for the tournament, three Final Fours, two national championship games, my assistant takes over, wins another national championship. That was a run for the ages. So I'll look back with nothing but incredible memories. And uh, those, those guys that stayed with me, they taught me, they taught me a lot. I may have taught them a few things about basketball, but they taught me an awful lot. I'm going to let you say something, Josh, real quick, but I, I just want to give you some props here for one second. Yes. And you've taken a lot of crap uh, over the years over Derek Anderson and not playing and not playing Derek uh, in the, in the finals. And I'm here to tell you, I was here the whole time Derek was here and Derek's knees were terrible and they were really bad. And at that time, I was, I, of course, I wanted us to win the title. I was so happy that you didn't play Derek because, and look, his, his career was shortened also because of his knees later on, had he played and had something gone on, there's a chance he may have never played in the NBA. So I want to thank you for that just as a fan. And I know you, you know, he, he was cleared a week before the tournament, but it was only like, eight or nine months from an ACL. Yeah. And the way you guys played and played defense and had to get out there after people, I'm glad you didn't play him. Thanks yeah. coach. And I went in the trainer's room and I said, Derek, he had a practice where he blew everybody away, including <laughs> yeah. the doctors. And I went to the trainer's room and I said, man, you look great. Uh, we're ready to win another championship. And he said to me, uh, I said, are you ready? And he said, whatever you think, coach, I, I, whatever you say, I'm there. Yeah. He didn't say, yeah, coach, I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> I know right. there was a little trepidation in his mind. Yeah. And I said, I know he's going to be a lottery pick. And I'll tell you the truth, Rex. I've never said this. Uh, and I, I thought we could beat Arizona with or without him. Uh, so, it, yeah. you know, I, so it wasn't about winning and losing. There was no doubt in my mind we were going to beat Arizona. Um, but uh, we didn't. And uh, it may have been the impetus for yeah. Tubby to win it the following year. That's you correct. never know how that works. Yeah, but uh, I, it was the right move Agreed. for the right reasons. Coach, I <clears throat> to piggyback that a little bit. I just I really just have to thank you for some of the greatest memories. As you know, we we live and breathe it in Kentucky. And I've always said it, it's almost it's weird. It's, there's a few fan bases that are kind of like that, but it's like people it's our complete identity is our basketball team. You know, I've lived in New York city. They think they don't even know where Kentucky is. They think we're the South. I've, I've lived in the South. They think we're the North. I've lived in on the West coast. They think we're in the heartland or they have no idea. It was a split state in the civil war. We just have this no identity and that became our identity. And when you came in this guy from the state, um, Rex Chapman, Rex Everett Chapman had, had left and left the program in shambles. Man, he just welcome. left it and we were as bad as we've ever been. <laughs> so it's my <laughs> reason that he can't, that it's my fault. And then you brought him. Yeah. It all comes back around, but you gave me some of the best memories you taught. The state is still so different. You know, we were Jimmy Chitwood, we were, we were, you know, the basketball, pass it around, eight passes before. And high school basketball changed in Kentucky as soon as you came. It was up and down, three-pointers. It still is. Yeah. It still is because of you and you were there and you taught. You embraced the fan base. We embraced you. When you left, that, it was so weird. We get, we practically, when you went to Boston, we gave you a parade, because we're so thankful of what you had done and, and came in and changed. So I just want to say thank you for that because a lot of great memories. Um, and 
what did you, you could have never guessed that the, the state of Kentucky would have this big of an impact in your life? What have you learned? What did you learn from Kentucky? Be, be, you know, like it, we don't teach a lot of things, but what did you learn from all your years in Kentucky? Well, you know, I wear I wear a shirt all the time. It's, it says Ph.D. and it stands for passion. It used to be poor, hungry and driven. Now it's passionate, hungry and driven. My players didn't like the poor part. So uh, I, the shirt really is, although it was a, a shoot off of a, a financial advisor named Mario Gabelli, uh, passionate, hungry and driven is really what Kentucky is all about. You know, I never complained about the call-in shows and the second guessing. I poked fun at, at some of the questions and they poked fun back. And I always embraced Eastern Kentucky. I always embraced the love of the game uh, that they had because quite frankly, that's the love I had. Uh, it, and it wasn't indicative of New York. It wasn't, in, although we have our Yankee fans, our Giant fans, uh, it just does never gets to the magnitude of Kentucky. And I appreciated that. The memories are awesome. And it, it just was a perfect fit because I was so passionate about the game. They were so passionate about the game. Winning meant so much to me. Winning meant so much to them. Losing meant it was such a hurt for me. And it was such a hurt for them. So it was the perfect fit at the perfect time in my life. Um, and it, the memories are awesome. You know, when you could look back and say on probation, the second year, we, we win the conference. We go to that great game the following year, three final fours. Um, and then so many players that just gave their heart and soul for their team. It's a great time. I, what I can't believe it's 25 years. Yeah. Um, that's to me is, is, is the most amazing thing. And I just was told the other day that a guy said he wants to do something this year for Providence's final four. It's 35 years. And I said, Oh my God, I know. although I'm, although I'm 68, I still act like I'm 38. Uh, but I still have the same passion. Thank God. And, and I own, it's just a cool little place uh, to keep it going, to keep that fire burning. Coach, well, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you for everyone in the state coach, why didn't you play Richie more? <laughs> actually i played them too much <laughs> they still do call in shows and they ask why why richie isn't playing you know it still happens with you know it's interesting if, if if i say those guys with those guys and if, if john pelfrey had a little bit of what rex had just a little bit more hops and a little bit more quickness that sucker could have had a 20-year career so smart but, he was one of the smartest basketball players I've ever coached. He knew, and it was funny because Ralph Willard, my assistant, said, hey, I've checked it around. You've got to, and, and they became very close later on. You've got to get rid of this John Pelfrey. He's a locker room lawyer. <laughs> I, always, I always kill Ralph every time I see him when we, because Ralph is a great evaluator of talent. I said, you wanted to get rid of John Pelfrey. <laughs> and he said, no, no, that was just in the beginning. I heard rumors that he was a locker room lawyer. I said, what do you mean locker room lawyer? He never played. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, that's so right. And, you know, I, I think part of the reason those guys are so beloved, you know, because Pelfrey and Feldhaus were on my team when I was at Kentucky. They were never going to play. Not at not when we were bringing in McDonald's All-Americans every year. Those guys were so happy. And they were going to start. They were going to start and play big minutes for Kentucky. And then you just came in and, and put them over the top. I, you know, Rex, they was, you know, they were so different, those three guys. Yeah. Even though they were from Eastern Kentucky, they, they really were. were. So different. Darren's from Maysville, and he's the good-looking guy that – Yep the hot throb of campus and yeah. Richie is, is the folk hero. <laughs> John Pelfrey from Paintsville is, is the, is the leader, the spokesperson. Yeah. Uh, they were so different in so many ways, but so beloved. I agree. You know, uh, and I'm thinking back to 68. I can't believe you're 68 it made me remember. I was trying to remember last night. I said, I think we celebrated your 40th birthday over on McMeekin. And I said, no, it had to be 50. Mm -hmm. And then I went back. No, I was 25 and you were 40. Yeah. I can't believe that that's happened. Go back. If you won't, I, I find this fascinating. Mm -hmm. I asked Cal this last year. Um, 
you talked about a boy uh, and a ball and a, and a dream, a basketball and a dream. Who did you grow up when you were seven, eight, ten years old? Who were you watching? Who were you hearing about that my, really my, molded you? My, it wasn't basketball because – Back then, there weren't many games televised. Matter of fact, the championship of the Knicks when they beat the Lakers, I think, was on delayed television. My my idol, the guy I loved, uh, everything about him was Mickey Mantle. Yeah. Uh, famous uh, Yankee legend. And then a little later on, it was Vince Lombardi. Uh, but it was never really a basketball player until the Knicks in 74 and 70 were winning championships we really didn't follow it too closely, but it was all about Mickey Mantle. And um, so, you know, for me growing up, it was more about baseball, baseball. than it was basketball, even though I was playing uh, much more basketball than anything else. But we didn't have, we're a pro pro town. Yeah. You know, so it's college, not until the big East did college basketball. It was all North Carolina back then. North Carolina was the big school for all the great, an area, the tri-state area in New York to look at. It really wasn't anything other than the New York Knicks, the Giants, and the Yankees. Yeah. Fantastic. Coach, um, you've, you've uh, coached so many great players. Um, so some of these questions are impossible to answer. But was, was there a time like in a practice or a game where a player did something and you, you just thought to yourself, holy shit, he is really – I've never seen he is that good where do, do some of those moments stand out to you with different players? You know, I didn't have, I didn't have like the Anthony Davis or the Zion Williamson or that type of basketball player at Kentucky. But I will say this, the 2013 team, um, I'm not going to say we're the best of all time because that's subjective. I will say at the end, when you win, when you're beating sec opponents by an average of 23 points in a really strong league back then, my second unit, I do believe, could have won the national championship. <laughs> so, I don't You're think talking about the 96 team. You 96 said 2013. Team. I don't think that team could have been beaten. I really don't. Their press was relentless. I remember when we beat Dale Brown by um, with that 15 minutes and 30 seconds, we were down 35 points or whatever yeah. it was, came back and beat him in regulation. The <laughs> following year was the revenge of Fat Tuesday. He was going to take it out on us, and we 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 had seventy six points at halftime. So um, <laughs> I don't think I don't think there was a team. I don't care if you go back to the great UCLA teams or the modern day teams that could have beaten that team. Now that's just me, and that's because of our style of play. I don't think that team could have been beaten because of their relentless pressure. Um, if we argue about it, okay, top three teams of all time, whatever you want to say. The UK guys in 2013, we all firmly believe that that team could not have been beaten. Um, I remember practices of Antoine Walker saying, coach, can I speak to you? What do you, Antoine was such a pain in the neck in practice with his trash. <laughs> he drove me crazy. But I love them. He would say, coach, do me a favor, get him off of me. He's going to lose his confidence guarding me. <laughs> I'd, I'd walk away laughing but I want to kill him because he would distract me. Coach, can I speak to you for a second? <laughs> but, you know, whether it was Mercer, Antoine, Derek, uh, no matter who it was, uh, Delk, McCarty, Pope, they were also all put together by Anthony Epps, Wayne Turner off the yeah. bench. They were just such a ferocious, deep, talented basketball team that all sacrificed for one thing. We had so much incredible pressure on ourselves to win that championship. Yeah. Um, applied by ourselves, applied by the fans, applied by the media, but we were going to win that. There was nobody going to beat us. And uh, that, that basketball team was one of the greatest of all time. I don't think anybody could have beaten us. That's just me and just the, the pride I have for that basketball team. How interesting was it because you started the year because you had these studs and you were trying to, put your best five out there and uh, you had Delk playing the point. And well, that then was it a all, mistake by all me. clicked <laughs> when you put Epps in. We lost and that was a mistake by me because I promised Tony I would play him more at the point when I recruited him. And I was just trying to put the five best players mm -hmm. on the basketball court. And sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes you got to put, you know, 
the, the round peg has got to go in the round hole. Oh. And uh, once I put Epps uh, into that position, everything clicked the right way. We ran just as many pick and rolls. We did just as many things for Tony as we did for Anthony. But Anthony was a big key in bringing Wayne Turner in off the bench. Uh, but our practices were legendary, legendary. The second unit didn't take anything from the first unit. And the units often changed. Guys went from first to second uh, often just because it was so highly competitive. But uh, And then the following year, when we lose all those guys – and we still go back and have a chance to win a championship and not to pick on Nazi, but if Nazi makes those free throws in overtime, we probably win a second championship. Um, and then I always say this, and I really mean it. Tubby wins a championship the third year. And I don't think I would have won the championship as a head coach. I really believe that. I think Tubby that, that comeback he had against Duke. Sometimes it's a different voice. You know, yeah. when you got, it's very difficult to go to a championship game three straight years but that different voice and that different change, uh, I think it was good that Tubby took over. And those three final games probably won't be duplicated for a long, long time. No, oh, sir. Um, Coach, I don't know that I've got a, another question here, but um, I, I, I I feel so fortunate. Eddie Sutton just passed away recently, also in the Hall of Fame. Um, I, uh, he, you know, ha- I kind of had a rocky relationship with Eddie while I was at Kentucky. Uh, when, but for 10 years after that, while I was playing in the NBA, you were essentially, you know, my coach in the summertime. Um, and I can attest to the fact that your players absolutely love you and, uh, they're as loyal to you as they can be. And one of the reasons I'm going to get emotional, but one of the reasons is because of things like, you know, when I was in rehab a few years ago in Louisville and you and Vinny. Uh, our guy Vinny just show up at rehab and I'm a mess and I'm a crying mess. And I'm, you know, I'm telling you I'm toxic. I'm never going to do anything. I'm never, nobody's going to want to. And you, you just looked me in the eyes and said, Hey man. And you told me a story that I'll never forget about, you know, having to eat, eat shit the size of a, of a volleyball and then doing the next right thing over time, you'll eat shit the size of a basketball and then a softball and then a golf ball and then a pebble. And I got to tell you in that moment, man, you know, I was just really searching. And as so many of us are when we're, when we're like that and we're looking for some kind of inspiration from anywhere we can find it. And as long as I live, I'll never forget that. You stayed for a couple hours, seasons going on. It's in September. I know you should be at practice and you're there with me. I love you. And I can't thank you enough. Um, and I, and that's just part of it. You do this with everybody. You do it with your players. You do it with your friends. And I just couldn't be more thankful to call you a friend. Well, I feel the same way and probably a good segue to end the podcast in terms of this. It's, you know, Rex, I've always considered you as if you played for me. Um, I, I did, I, you know, it's, I never got a chance to coach you uh, on the court, but um, off the court, I felt you were no different than any player I've ever coached. And, you know, as a coach, the best part, the legacy that you leave in coaching um, is not the seven final fours of the championships. The legacy is, is the players you coach. Um, And I've always considered you one of my players, uh, even though Eddie had the great fortune to coach you. Um, and, and I've been blessed, you know, it, it along the way where you are today, you've become a, um, uh, a, a phenomenon with the, the Twitter account <laughs> and now you're doing podcasts, but you're an extremely talented young man. Thanks, bud. Uh, and, and I think this is going to hold true. You're going to somehow rival your talents on the court, which is really difficult off the court for you to accomplish that, but you're going to do it because you're such a good person with such a big heart and um, you've been through the tough things, but so what I always judge people, how they get off the mat, not how they get on the mat. You've got off it in a big way. I'm so proud of, you You know, I love you. Thank you. And um, we're going to be friends for a long period of time. Absolutely. Get up Tyona, see us play. Uh, You'll get a big kick out of it. I'll be there. Yeah. And uh, you got four seats for Josh and I. We I do. And then okay. <laughs> when we get to the final four, 
you've got a ticket. And I, I tell people that on my tombstone, it's going to say, Cal, you're never going to catch me. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, coach. Hey, if you, you win it, you win it at Iona. You're gonna get an Iona tattoo. <laughs> you know what? Uh, if I win it at Iona, I'll get it on my forehead, like Mike Tyson. <laughs> It'll be on my eyes. <laughs> but I, I, would, uh, I would like to say this in closing. You know, uh, I've known John Calipari for since he was a young camper, five star as well, and he has been a great guardian of that program. He's taken it to a level that I didn't even think it could reach in terms of uh, in terms of the players he's brought in there. It's amazing. I think someday 30 or 40 percent of the NBA is going to be UK grads. He's, he's done a <laughs> remarkable, remarkable job. He's been a great guardian of that basketball program. And I'm uh, it's and I'm going to tell you this, Rex, this is going to sound crazy to you. But a lot of my friends, um, so-called friends, abandoned me when I went to Greece. You know who texted me the most? And now forget my guys like Billy Donovan and Mick Cronin, forget the guys. But you know what non-coach texted me the most? Are you doing okay? I feel I feel bad for you, coach. I hope you're hanging in there. Who? John Calipari. Was it? Now, we were not close friends. I know, back I in, know. You know I know. Day, back yeah. in the day when he was a camper, we were very close. Mm -hmm. But John Calipari, for the two years I was in Greece, always reached out to see how I was doing. That's great. And, that, and, and by the way, that was never publicized. I never told anybody that, but uh, that tells you a little bit about him that people don't know about. I agree. Thank don't you. you have a, do you have a favorite movie? Uh, you know, everybody, every Italian says the Godfather one and two. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to say three, right? <laughs> Partially because we're so embarrassed about our heritage, but we realized that was our heritage. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, really, I, I, I thought Godfather 2 was so dark, but so incredible. Yeah. Uh, I have so many memories. I actually played basketball at McBurney's YMCA with Al Pacino right no after way. we made The Godfather. I chose Al Pacino into the games when I was in college because of the, because he was Al Pacino. Now, he was a five foot eight guy who couldn't play. And when you lose at McBurney's Y, it's over for the day because yeah. <laughs> his win is out uh, for an hour. But I would get, I would lose the game intensely to choose Al Pacino. In. So I guess I got to go Godfather too. I love it. All right. Well, how about this? Front row center for dead or alive, any band or speaker or front row center, anyone. Ooh. Ah, boy, that's tough. Yeah, that is a tough one. Uh, you know, people would say Jesus or something, but that's so unrealistic. Um, I, I guess more than anything else, I probably I always love listening to Jim Valvano speak at the camp and everything. Mm, Whether he's beautiful. bringing out a rat. He was so inspirational. Yeah. And, and I knew I used to play one on one with Jim at Long Island Lutheran basketball camp when I was at UMass and he just left Rutgers. And we'd play every lunchtime and just a regular guy made it so big. And on his darkest moment, his most difficult moment, riddled with cancer, to give that speech, tell you volumes of what he's all about, because I know how much pain he was in when he had to give that speech as he was helped off the stage by Vital. So I guess uh, Jimmy V stuck out in my mind as just someone with such incredible courage. Beautiful. Beautiful answer. Coach, thank you. Uh, I'm sure you're running to get on a plane or go see a kid, do something. So thank you. Uh, please come back. Come back uh, anytime. Anytime you'll have me, Rex. And look forward to teeing it up with you and seeing you and having a meal together. Can't wait. Thanks, Coach. Great. Great, okay. guys. Thanks for being. Thank thanks you, for Coach. Thanks me back in the day also. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, guys. Well, Josh, that was Rick. Thoughts? <laughs> Yeah. Did not disappoint. I got, I would, again, would love to talk to him for two more hours. I had so many questions. I wanted to know more about his time at Louisville, how he got to Louisville, what, what he was thinking. I wanted to know about his, it's uh, so much. I just. Same. I, can't, can't you tell why, why he's so 
Well, he's just so charming uh, to begin with. He's smart, he's funny, quick, quick-witted, mm-hmm. and yes. you can see why he's a hit in, you know, families' living rooms, why, sure, and why you trust your kid, you know, to go off and play for him. I, I said forever, you know, my son Zeke, uh, he, Zeke loves Rick. He started going to his camps when he was little. And uh, so R- Zeke has a real af- affinity for Rick as well. But, you know, if my son or uh, ha- or anybody's son has a chance to go play f- for Rick Pitino at Louisville, I've always told him, that's where you go. You know, if you can go and play for that guy, because here, here's the real reason. If you if you go, you're gonna, and, and stay four years, you will definitely graduate because they're going to make sure that that happens. You're going to definitely graduate. And if you're if you're good enough, you will play in the NBA. By the time you leave playing four years for him, you are you are as good and as skilled as you're going to be. Now, you may get better. You may grow a little more. You may, but you are as close to a finished product as, you know, many guys who are in the league for two or three years because of that ind- individual instruction that he gives every that was a beautiful day. story man right. about him visiting you in rehab i didn't oh, know yeah. the full extent of that and i could see yeah. why he would always stay in your heart after something like that when yeah. the chips are down and yeah. people show up you don't forget it yeah and he knows a little bit about having the chips being down he's been yeah. down a time or two but mm-hmm. uh again he's a he's a lifer and he he's He's a he's a good friend. I'm glad that we got to spend some time with him today. What a, a what a guy! Fun. Right? Yeah. Um, we got the NBA playoffs coming up, buddy. I can't wait. You know, this I is know. next we're Tuesday. We're gonna have a lot to talk about. No question. You know, uh, I guess that's gonna pretty much do it for us this week. You know what people should do though? What's that? They should subscribe, rate, and review the Rex Chapman Show with Josh Hawkins, powered by basketballnews.com yes week, sir episode 11 that was fun we'll be back next week guess with who the ceo of the philadelphia 76ers wow that's a different angle i love it let's go next week see you